OK, so today we're going to have a look at programming the FMC in X-Plane 11 in the Zeebo 737-800X. Uh, this is in response to somebody asking me in a comment to one of the other videos, could I go through looking at the FMC in a bit more detail? So that's what we're going to do today. Obviously, to program the FMC, we need a flight plan. So I've got little nav map up and running connected to the simulator. You can see I'm on the ground at Stansted, and I've programmed in a short route that will take us from Stansted to Birmingham. Now, we're not actually going to fly it today. We're just going to go as far as programming the FMC. So we need to... Um, I, well, in the plan, I've chosen a, a standard instrument departure, BKY5R. I've chosen a number of waypoints, Mowgli, Updock, and BBN32. And then ILS into uh, Birmingham. We're also going to go for a flight level of 12,000 feet, or flight level 120. Um, so yeah, this is just a little example plan to show how we might program that into the FMC. So if we switch over to X-Plane, we've got the 737 sat here on the tarmac, and it's cold and dark, so we're just going to do enough to go and get the FMC up and running to begin with. So first things first, turn the battery on. So systems light up all over the place, there's lots of reds everywhere because it hasn't got full power to anything yet. The next thing we typically do on a proper startup sequence is go and switch on the inertial guidance system. So switch on both left and right IRS knobs and they switch to a line all on their own when they're ready and then switch the indicator above to heading status. So it tells you how many minutes until alignment will be complete. Um, oh, back, back above our head we need to turn on the APU, it's complaining that we haven't got power, or it's complaining that it was still on battery power basically. So we're switching on APU, and we hold it on to start, and we wait for the needle on the exhaust gas temperature to get past 2 and we let go so we can see the needle is now going round. As soon as we have APU power, we can switch over bus transfer to the APU, which we can do here. He says famous last words, we have to wait for it for a moment. We can turn on the APU bleed while we're at it. We have to wait for the, the blue light, basically. If we zoom in on this blue light, it's complaining, basically, that we're on battery power and the battery is depleting. There we go. So APU gen off bus. What it means is the APU is available, but we haven't connected it to the bus. So then we can do that. Yeah. So the two on the outside are the engines. So as soon as we've got the engines up and running, we could say gen off, or we could... Um, switch over the cross feeds to the engines instead and then the electricity will be provided by the engines so these blue lights basically say that the power is not coming from there does that make sense so we can i'll leave that alone okay so we're here to play with the fmc so we've got enough power through the apu to be able to just get on with programming the FMC up. Everything it's complaining about is because the engines aren't running. So, the MCDU. When you first look at it, if you're in the same situation as me and you don't have Navigraph, it's going to complain that the nav data is out of date. That's because the navigation data that the MCDU uses is date limited. So it will complain if you are outside of its expiry date. So you can just press the clear button and that error goes away. So we're going to go into the FMC. And the first thing we need to do is initialize its position in the world. So we go to pause in it and click on the button next to it. And you will see there's a set IRS position. Now, if you see any boxes in these displays, those are parameters you have to fill in. So there's a trick here. You can see we are in page one of three. If we go next page, we can actually see from the GPS on the aircraft what our um, position is. So if we press the button next to one of those GPS settings, it will copy the number from there into here. Now this is called the scratch pad. I kind of think of it as a buffer, but it's called the scratch pad. So by clicking on either of those, we'll put them in the scratch pad. Then we can go to previous page and notice this has been held onto. So this is essentially what we are going to type in 
if we press the button next to something else. So we've got this here, we can click there and it transfers it from the scratch pad into the place that we've just keyed it. Now you can type things into the scratch pad look and you can type in backspace back through them with the clear button. So anyway, we've set up the IRS position. So that's all good. We can set the reference airport, but notice it's got hyphens through it. That means we don't have to do it, but I'll just do it anyway, because it helps me explain something else later. So EGSS is where we're taking off from. We are at gate 23R. And now we can go to route. So a lot of this is kind of guided by the button at the bottom right of what you need to do next. So route origin. And notice it's got EGSS already in the scratch pad. That's because we set it as our reference airport. So we don't have to type EGSS to put it into the origin. So we can just go bang and there it goes. It asks for the runway we want to take off on. We can say runway 22 because we're at Stansted. So again, a lot of this relies on you having done a bit of homework beforehand or getting a, a plan from Simbrief or something like that, which you can then obviously read or you could make one up in Little Nav Map and then you'd know all these bits and pieces. Destination, we're going to Birmingham, which is E-G-B-B. -B. Okay, so let's put our destination in. We can put a flight number in if we want. We really don't have to, but say if we said BA-123 for the British Airways, for example. Again, this anything with hyphens you don't have to do. Stay away from company route. That's got hidden functionality in the Zebo Mod 737. That it will load an FMS plan if you type in the same file name in there. So don't put anything in the company route if you're planning it by hand. Performance initialization is the next page to go through. So it wants the gross weight at the top and, the, and it will figure out the, the cruise center of gravity or we can key it as well. So gross weight. So we're going to go across, if I go back out, there's this Avitab tablet in the Zebo 737. If we zoom in on it, you can see there's a fuel weight and balance section and there's a payload section within that and this will give us our numbers for the fmc so obviously you should have really put your fuel in ahead of time so which you can do by weight and balance in the simulator so you know you can give, give yourself some more fuel so i'm only giving myself fuel in the wing tanks not in the central tank so apply changes so it's saying here, my takeoff weight is 111315 pounds. So back in the FMC, the gross weight, it wants it in thousands of pounds. Yeah, so we want 111.3. Just to explain this, there's our payload. We've got no payload. Zero fuel weight, so the empty weight of the aircraft, 95,000 pounds. And the, the weight of the fuel we are carrying, which is 16. So those added together is the takeoff weight. So 111.3 we need to put into the FMC. Sorry, 111.3. That is correct, isn't it? Let's have a quick look across. It was 111.3. So we just type the number in and then we press where we want to enter it. Reserves. So this is how many thousand pounds of fuel you want to have in reserve. So this would be to get to, to do a, a go around or um, if you wanted to divert to another airport. So typically five is fine, so 5,000 pounds. But you have to remember you need, you th need therefore to be carrying the amount of fuel to do your journey that's been predicted on your flight plan. You also need 5,000 on top of that. Otherwise this will complain that you haven't got enough fuel. Cost index is an interesting one. It uses a mathematical formula, which I'm not going to get into here. It basically relates to how much fuel you're willing to burn to complete the journey. So that will affect your climb rates and things like that. And your cruise speed, how, how quickly you get to your cruise speed. So, you know, how much fuel you can burn to accelerate the aircraft. A typical rate would typically be 20. Um, you can put as much as 200 in there on a 737. I'm going to put 100, which is extremely wasteful. So at the top of here, you can see some more boxes we need to fill in. It's asking for the cruise altitude. So we said 120, which is, we could type 120,000 and it'd be fine. But 
uh, sorry, um, 12,000, sorry, and it would be fine. But I'm going to put 120, which is flight level 120, times 100 is the height in feet. So 120, flight level 120. Now, it's saying here, we've got enough now to go. We could go and fill in all the other things, like the cruise wind direction and speed. So at our cruise altitude, we could fill in all those kinds of things. We're not going to bother. So we're going to execute what we've got so far. And then we're going to go to the N1 limit page. So it kind of guides you through the pages bit by bit. We, I'll show you afterwards so we can skip through these pages ourselves. So this is to do with the climb rate. And the, um, we can modify the way the aircraft is going to climb. Typically you wouldn't, you just leave it as standard. Then we go to takeoff. And we can set the well, we have to set the flaps level. So I'm going to say I'm going to take off with five degree flaps. So that automatically calculates the rotate speeds because I've given it the weight and the flaps now, remember. So I can go and put in the I just click the button next to each of those to transfer the calculated speeds into my V1, V rotate, V2 speeds. It's also asking for a center of gravity. The reason for doing this is so you can trim the aircraft properly before you even take off. So if we go and quickly look back across at the tablet, you can see on that payload page, it also calculated the takeoff weight center of gravity. So 23.1%. So if we go back to the FMC, we can put in 23.1. As soon as we do that, it tells us what trim to set on the aircraft, 4.25. So basically, based on the weight in the aircraft, we now know how to trim the elevators to make sure that nothing untoward happens as we accelerate down the runway. So, you know, the nose doesn't suddenly lift. 4.25. So if we come back to our normal view, we, it's as important that we're in the normal place where our head would be at this point. We're going to look down, and there's the trim gauge, and we can roll this with the mouse wheel to get it to about to get this needle to about 4.25 yeah so it's not an exact science but that's what it's asking for okay so you can see now it's asking it, departure has lit up here so essentially if we go and have a look around we've got our route programmed in we can skip around all these buttons so we've got the initialization stuff which we've already done which is all the n1 and all the rest of it and the weights we've got our route pre-programmed in we've done our takeoff stuff we haven't done the departure and arrival airports, so we can go to departure and arrival. If we look in legs as well, it's empty at the moment. If we go departure and arrival, we are departing from, now it's got runway 22 selected because we said it earlier, yeah? So we can, if we go and click on it again, it will only show us the SIDs that relate to runway 22. Does that make sense? So we were going to take off on SID BKY5R, which is that one. So I've selected that and that, and then I can say root. And it's, uh, notice it now says activate. So although I have chosen my departure, it hasn't activated it yet. So I can say activate and then execute. So that kind of pushes it into the FMC, into the flight plan. If we go and look on legs now, we can see the legs of that procedure, that standard instrument departure procedure. So by the same token now, we can go and set up our arrival. So I've gone to the departure and arrival page, and I can go to arrival. And I want to land on ILS on runway 33. And I'm not going to bother with the star. I'm just going to go straight into runway 33. And I can execute. So that's done that. Now, have we got this yet? Yeah, this is already switched on. So having done that, you can see the flight plan has appeared. Now, if we go and look in legs and go and look through them, yeah, great. We've got a discontinuity in the flight plan. So you have to go and check this. After you've put in your departure and arrival, go and look through the legs and go to next page and keep flicking through it until you've seen the whole plan. And you can see I've got a discontinuity. Now, we already know that between the beginning, CI-33 is the ILS for runway 33, and this is the end of my SID, my standard instrument departure. So in between there, it's complaining that it doesn't know the route in between, basically. So I can insert the rest of my waypoints. 
So if you remember, I've got them written down in front of me. This again, pen and paper is invaluable for this. I want to put in Mowgli, Upduck, and BBN32 as navigation waypoints. So we're going to go Mowgli, M O G L I, and put it in there. Okay, so notice it, the discontinuity has now vanished because it's got, it, for some reason, it always likes to have a waypoint in between the departure and the arrival plan. Notice we haven't got anywhere to then put another waypoint in. So we can insert waypoints on top of existing ones and it will push them down. So after Mowgli, we want up duck. Up duck. So if we put this on top of CI33, it will push CI33 down. And we can then execute. And again, it's put a then in, which is good. It saves us doing it again over the top of one. We can put in BBN32. BBN32. And we can put that in the then. Execute. So, unfortunately, that hasn't inserted another one. So let's try it. If I put in BBN32, I want to try and do this wrong on purpose. Yeah, it's not going to let me. Let's go and have a quick look. I, I want to insert one more. We'll put in, we're going to take it back out, nod GU. Yeah, we'll put it in on top of CI33. Nod GU. Yeah, perfect. So that has put in a discontinuity now. I don't know all of the rules around why discontinuities happen, but I can show you how to clean it up. <clears throat> One of the ways you can do it is to select an existing... Um, leg and then select the then marker and it will move everything from there down up yeah so it's done it if I don't want nod GU now I can say Dell and select nod GU and that's done that now I can do the same again and I can move this discontinuity back up over the top of there does that make sense? So we were able to very quickly and easily either insert waypoints or delete them entirely or remove discontinuities by moving everything below them up. And that's basically it. We've got our flight plan now. So you can see it's lit up, the IRS is aligned. So the next job for us really in the real world will be to go and start the engines, which I'm not going to bother with today because this was all about the FMC and getting familiar with things. Obviously. If I go and start the engines and move the crossfeed over, all of the warnings will disappear. So there you go. That was using the FMC in the Boeing 737-800, the Zebo Boeing 737-800 in X-Plane 11.5. It's so accurate, as far as I can tell on the FMC, you can get the real book for the aircraft, the operating manual, and follow the instructions in it, and it's to the letter, basically. Oh, something else we haven't looked at just before we close. When you're in flight, the progress menu, once you've got your flight plan all programmed in, the progress menu is really handy. You would typically leave it on this during the flight and tells you what's happening next. Something else you can do, final thing, kind of this is the um, one more thing, Steve Jobs kind of thing. This is quite cool. When you're looking at the legs page, so I've clicked on legs, and we've got the FMC, uh, sorry, the MFD, is it they're called? The dis display here of the flight plan. Notice up here you've got, typically this is in map mode. If we switch it to plan mode, we can zoom in. Now watch what happens. Notice when you're looking at the legs page, there's a step button. We can step through the flight plan. And it, notice it puts a CTR center marker on. So that's what's center, centered on the plan. Does that make sense? Obviously, you can go you can go all the way around the plan doing it, just to check your plan to make sure it makes sense. And then it will come back to the start at the once it's done it. EGSS, we're back at EGSS. Okay, so that's it. Normally, you'd leave it on progress mode, like I said. So there you go. I I think that's enough. Probably blown your brain out doing that. <laughs> 
I'll fly a route another day. Okay, I'll end the video there.